And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother and a newcomer to the temple. In the blue corner... The cr the creator of Parslings and one of the many people in the sm in the Smunchy Games family, the the man of a thousand words, and a thousand spell words, good br good brother Blue Two Days, and in the red corner, the le the lead developer for pa for Parslings Avarice, the one the one and only <laughs> Libroc aka aka Kareem. How you two doing tonight? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How, how are you doing, Blue? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. Same as always. Um. So, I, Leo. I know it's. I know it's. Um. It's been a. It's been a hot minute since I had. Since I had you on, on the on the temple when it came to um the Parslings game itself. So, how have you, how have you been holding up with in that? in that front since I last had John. It's been not too bad. Like just more work here and there. A lot of logistics. Um so you know printing is a, a little bit of hell. Yeah. And I've mm -hmm. been working on Everest with Kareem and some other projects. So So I've been busy. <laughs> so as I understand it, Parceling's Avarice is your is your guys' attempt to do a video game adaptation of the Parcelings system. So, I'll start with the, op I'll start with the opening set setup. How did the how did this come about? Where where um the idea of put of doing um Parcelings in video game form started to set in. So how did this one to cream? Yeah, <laughs> I guess I was the one who initiated it. Um, Leo and I have known each other for a very long time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was following the development of Parslings from near the beginning of it. Um, I think I was the first playtesting group. I was the first playtest jam. I might be wrong about that. Uh, first group. blind playtest. First blind playtest group. Um, and funnily enough, the first blind test campaign was um, Avarice, um, which I'll get into later, I guess. Um, and so the the idea just came from we had this campaign we were having a great time uh we really like the world in the setting not only of you know what we made obviously it's our baby but the the parceling system in the parceling world just in general uh we we just loved what it had to offer and i guess i was just at a time where i wanted to pick up a project and at first it was going to be something fairly casual uh i hadn't planned on making something super professional and, and real at the time um it was just going to be something I did on my own. And then I brought it to Leo. I asked him, hey, can I make this game? I can put Parsling's name on it or take it off. I don't know the legal surrounding that. And he actually brought up that I could just speak to the publisher. And things just kind of blew up after that, right? After I spoke to the publisher, he saw it as an awesome opportunity. Um, and we put together a team. And I guess that's where, that's where it all came from. I, I do want to make one point clear, though, that it's... I would say less of an adaptive. Don't of the weep for the stupid. You'll be that it's inspired off of the system in the world. In the spirit of, yeah, in the spirit of. Mm -hmm. So and again, it, it was quite. It was quite the surprise when Cream did say that he wanted to make a video game of Parsing Zen. I was super excited, so I just ended up just talking to Smunchy, and then we had that chat. So mm -hmm. it's. Again, it's just how opportunities happen. They just simply mm -hmm. is when like minds get together and things mm -hmm. just get moving, really. So it's been a blast working with Cream. That yeah. we've had our arguments here and there, as <laughs> as one does. <laughs> yeah, we've gotten stronger because of that. Yeah. <laughs> now, when it comes to do, when it comes to doing the I came to do. I came to adapt. I came to adapting. And first off, the way that it's that it was pitched, you guys are you guys are aiming for more of 
what some what some would call what some would call a JRPG approach, and I personally call a console style RPG approach because I don't <laughs> like the term JRPG. Um, was that was that just based on? <laughs> I said that's fair. <laughs> I'll I'll get into, been... I'll get into that. Yeah. I'll get into why in a second. But oh, okay, what what it was was it just based on the fact that 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 you wanted to do something that was um that was based on the kind of games that you grew up on? Yeah, I, I would say it's a combination of two things. One, you've nailed it. I think any good game developer, artist in general, will pull from things they know pull from experiences that they grew up with and they enjoyed it, it's a much bigger monster when you try to make something that you really don't have a much passion behind mm -hmm. and so growing up with with rpgs and i can get into to, to what those games were that influenced uh, our game in a bit but um it, that was one big part of it the secondary aspect is rpgs console rpgs <laughs> are known for for a reason to have a lot of space for story and since it's based on a tabletop rpg having a robust story is kind of what we wanted to go for obviously you can go two different directions with something like this you can make it very blank slate um you know fallout new vegas you make your own character you do your own adventure do your own world or you can have it be very um like pokemon uh, yeah, that has a very specific story that you're following, and both of those are very mm -hmm. well, a uh, very good fit for the console RPG genre. Yeah, um, I will admit that the re the reason why I'm not I'm not a fan of the term JRPG is, um, for one, I, f I find the I find people's definition of it to be um, inconsistent and circular. Like, whenever whenever I would ask people what Whereas, some, whereas something like console style makes more sense to me because you look at the patient zero of the of that particular um that particular play style which is Dragon Quest which the sole reason well I'm not gonna say the sole reason but one of the big things that that was trying to do was um take the take the kind of experience from from wizardry and the like and simplify it for the Famicom um. Yeah, I I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, it, it was specifically it, made for consoles instead of for P, instead of for PC engines, which which. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No. Well, thing is, like, the consoles came first before the PC engines, and that's really where the origin of RPGs do lie, because a lot of them were built as. Oh, oh actually, were they? No, um, I think like not exactly. Um, it's not exactly the, it start, it started out as, it started out at, RPGs started out as PC and then P, and then PC engine material. And, okay. um, obviously, obviously the, um, piece where piece, the line between PC engine and PC is, is kind of blurry. Um, it's, mm. it's mainly the one, but dedicated, but, um, PC engine was mostly a Asia and, um, Europe thing. Um, mm. as a, it didn't really, the stuff like the, stuff like the Commodore and the like was around in the States, but it didn't really catch on at the same level. Um, and okay. the, the earliest, the, some of the earliest, um, versions of the, of the whole idea of doing RPG in a video game were on the, were on the, uh, Plato servers in the seventies. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. Um. And, and, like I mentioned, the um the ancestor when it comes to the Japanese style of it is the is the Wizardry series. Um, which didn't do great in the in the US in its early days, but it did very well in Japan to the point that Japanese knockoffs happened, and the and then, um, the whole like I mentioned before there. Yuji Hori was tapped to do a um, simplified version for the family computer, and that ended up being Dragon Quest. Um, right. And given given the whole blank slate versus di versus directed um, tale, are you guys going for more? Are, now I can imagine visually that you're going for more of a for more of a um, more of a manga influenced style, 
but when it comes to when it comes to mechanically speaking, are you going for more of the blank sl blank slate approach that you would see in a PC style game, or are you going with a more directed um, story? So, in terms in terms of the art style, um, just to to make a note on that, um, I don't actually think you, you it'll, more more art will come out and 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 you'll see it. But it's we have a very unique art style that we're going for too. Yeah. Um, so it's not going to be probably what you're used to from Parsons, not fully at least. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. But to speak more to your first question, yes, we're going to go for the more directed style, more of a story told in the world mm -hmm. rather than you can create your own story in the world. Yeah. And that's because we want to have that kind of tighter, um, just well put together story. But that, you know, obviously every game needs to be open mm -hmm. in terms of the gameplay. Um, but the story itself, yeah, is a more, it's about um, specific characters and there's a specific uh, story that's being told. Yeah. Now, when it, com when it comes to the art style, would it, is it, you, s you said it, m it might not be one that I'd expect. Is it, is it similar or different to the art style one would see in, um, in the Parcelings books? Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's a, that's a good question. The, I think I'll direct like the second half of this to blue, but I'll try my best at it because <laughs> blue is, is acting as a pseudo art director for the game mm -hmm. uh, along with our other artist. Um, and so he's a lot of the environments are using a lot of the same colors and feel that the parceling books use. And that comes from just one of the artists who works on it. it also worked mm -hmm. on the books, um, but the character art, um, the sprite work that's being done by different artists and we're going for more of a, Mm. it's realistic cartoon style uh let's see if i can pull from any examples hmm i'd say closer to I dragon's would... crown almost that's the first one that comes to my head but obviously less levacious and brutalicious um, <laughs> than dragon's crown i'd say it's a little more realistic than pokemon um, the more recent Pokemon games, it, but it still goes for the relatively cartoony, yeah. Yeah, and I I will freely I will freely admit that um. I you that referring to it as something a bit something manga style or manga influence is that is definitely a wide net to cast. Yes. But the reason I um. I went with that I went with that particular naming convention. Is because is because of the fact that it within the within that particular approach you def you have a whole lot of you have a whole lot of variance but there's a lot of emphasis on simplicity in terms of where the eyes are being drawn where the eyes are being um, drawn to I think that's I think that's fair in the sense that, I mean I guess I would I, this I, arguably that's that's good character design, right? It's it's having that simple simple design that draws eyes to it. The more complicated they get, the harder it is for, in any medium, but especially games, um, the harder it is for players to follow it. And so, you know, it's more conducive to game design. Um, and that's why you see it a lot in games versus there are games that have very, very complicated character designs. Um, and those are arguably pretty muddy. And so, yeah, I think that's a fair net to cast because it would be arguably the good, you know, the the, the best direction to go uh, in terms of best uh, visual experience for a player. Yeah. And... So again, it comes from a lot of experimentation, the art style that we're going for whole between the two artists. So myself and Tari, or Pale Knight, um, and so it's been a bit of a learning curve um, working with each other mm -hmm. and picking out things that will mesh together, but we are very much, I guess, fans of thicker outlines, like thick lines, a bit more cartoonish, but mm -hmm. they go for a little bit more of a realistic palette, whereas I go for, I guess, more, it is kind of like half watercolor, half pastels, and I'm not really sure where I developed those color styles, but it's going to be a bit of a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea with games is that you do have a little bit of contrast from the background 
so and the characters and the and the people that live in it so that it becomes easy to identify easily watch easy to play that you're not sort of scrambling around looking for details and i think that's where a lot of um first person shooters and what and the more gritty um gritty uh i i guess computer styled um rpgs tend to fail at um, because they end up going very detailed, equal amounts of detail in both the character and the background. So it's not a easy difference between it. Um, so it's something that we did want to avoid, and it's something that we definitely designed around. Oh, all right. And on this particular question of art style, I'll get to the big. I'll get to one of the bigger elephants in in the particular room. Are you guys? Do you guys plan on leaning more, leaning more towards poly or leaning more towards sprites? Sprites, for sure. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of the choices we make for art, and this is something I learned because this is the first game I've developed. I've done, I've made systems and softwares and design things. Like I, I have my regular job right mm -hmm. um, before this, and. This is something that's very unique to this uh, medium is a lot of the, especially because we have such a small team, a lot of the choices we make are a combination of reliance. Like the art ties directly into the gameplay. <clears throat> the way the choices we make, like Blue said, are designed directly as a result of the gameplay. But in addition to that, um, a, secondary, uh, a secondary consequence of having such a small team and only two artists is we have to play their strengths. And so a lot of games are 3D poly um, because from a high level with enough pipelines and systems, you could you could develop um, a really efficient way of making art and pumping out assets. But with a small smaller team who isn't experienced in those mediums, um, you need to lean into their strengths. And so, yeah, we're going towards the sprites, the 2D. Um, there is some aspect of that in the way the art is being done mm -hmm. and in ways that we use um, we use tools and, and processes that you would see in like 3D modeling. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Spine, but it's oh, a yeah, a 2D art program. Darkest Dungeon uses it. Mm -hmm. um, Slay the Spire uses it. Um, it's, it's, it's the 2D equivalent of a 3D rigging and modeling system. So you still use things like that to make things efficient, but we mm -hmm. lean towards the strengths. If, if both the artists were 3D modelers, the game probably would have been 3D. Very different game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although, give, given, given the emphasis on, th on thicker lines and more, and more of a watercolor approach, I could easily see... Um, I could easily see this being a bit trickier to implement in in three in three D for the same reason that certain certain art certain artists whose art works really good in two um, D doesn't translate well to polys. Like the big example for the big example of this kind of thing for me is people like um, Yoshitaka Amano, who I absolutely adore his art, but I am well aware that that would be asking way too much even for, even for a current tech. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, you know, there are ways that you can, you can mix mediums and, and make really interesting, you know, with enough money and time, you could do anything. I mean, look at uh, Okami as watercolor hardline 3D models, right? <laughs> so there's technically a world where it exists, um, but it definitely requires a lot of experience. Uh, yeah. it, it's fun to imagine what something like that would look like, though. Yeah, and given the given that. The other the other major question that that I have is in regard to adapting the um, parceling system into a into a video game setup because this is always where the tricky part happens. Mm -hmm. You ha you can have some cases where you, and I will I will note that when it comes to this sort of conversion thing, I am excluding Fallout because the special system is has has only a tangential relationship with GURPS in the way that it developed. Yeah, it was originally supposed to be using GURPS, but that didn't last. And the special system as it is now is is ve has very little in common with um, with GURPS, namely the fact that I'm not using calculus to get a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> but what I am curious what I'm curious about is 
the discussions that you guys have had regarding what to keep and what not to keep mm -hmm. for adapting parcelings, deck building, and, yeah. and, and word-based mechanics into a video game format. It, you know, it's interesting you ask what, what discussions we had. <laughs> we seem to be in pretty much agreement as soon as as soon as the the high level of the game was determined, but basically we had the pitch and the com the conversation about it, and we were mostly on the same page. And you know, this is what I what I was saying. I think you would find interesting uh, about um, what we ended up doing as the decision, and that's it's when we say it's in the spirit of parse things, we really mean that. Mm -hmm. um, it uses the world and the same base ideas and concepts, right? Someone, you know. This person has a word. This person has a word. Um, you use those words together. You create, um, you create a uh, spell, right? And that's the concept. That's the baseline of it, right? Um, but in making that into a game, you have to consider, especially because our goal wasn't to make a game that emulates parslings. It was to make a game that exists uh, in the parslings world or alongside it, right? Yeah. And so, since that was our goal, rather than like I said, emulating it, um, you have a different set of you have a different path basically there's the path if you had tried to emulate it and that would be taking the system maybe using the cards not using the cards but trying to make it so that any player could come up with any set of words and any set of interpretations and you start to see that monster right that 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 monument that appears even breath of the wild doesn't allow you to combine every single item and cook every single possible recipe 50 percent of them 70 percent of them turn into trash um and so that you know that's that's designed intentionally and in a similar way you know we we can some of the we, we basically like package some of the 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 parses that you can do um and we do that purposefully you know to make a more valuable end product and i think this is this comes from the same kind of argument or design philosophy i don't know if you saw for a while everything used to be randomly generated for like five years in every single indie game uh yeah. people yeah pe people realize they didn't like that very much um and it's because when you mm -hmm. randomly or you when you allow such openness into a game you can't really deliver a curated experience right something that it becomes a, player a different wants. game mm -hmm. it becomes it, a very it, different game well not only does it become different it, it's a it's a it's a crazy challenge to develop something that you can randomize just from a technical perspective to randomize or not randomize but allow that level of openness um and then also provide a memorable experience right? and still create that in a reasonable amount of time. And what you end up seeing is like, you know, if, if we had done it that way, you might see, oh, every time you use a fire parse and or the word fire and the word ice, it just takes aspects of the words. And then, you know, the player can see through that. They can see that. So we decided to go in the direction, create canned, curated, custom and interesting effects rather than allowing the player to do basically anything. Yeah. And given that, given that this is this is where the this is where um, another aspect I, I have to be cur curious about is like you hint you hinted at the parse part of it, but the other thing I'm curious about how, about whether or not you plan on implementing is the card aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You know the whole deck, yeah. the whole deck building aspect because I if. Obviously, if you were to adapt that straight, I could see that being tri being tricky if you have multiple mm -hmm. characters manage having to manage different um, decks. Mm. Yeah, you know it's and and blue, it you be, know, what? Well, yeah. Sorry, yes, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I would say um, I was going to hand it off to blue, but but in my my thought process in the way direction we went. Um, we're not using the cards. And my thought process was the cards are basically a way to represent how your character is a, is a parceling, basically. It's to represent your abilities. It's to represent your character. Um, and a video game is another way to do a similar thing. Um, so it's just a different medium. Like if you would use dice instead of cards, it's all mechanical, right? It's not really part of the story or the world. And that's kind of what we're, 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 we're pulling from. And I guess I'll hand that one off to Blue because... You know, I don't want to overstep yeah. that one. And, yeah. So, again, cards were just used as a different form of medium to t to generate a pro probability engine. So, in the end, it wasn't core to the actual parslings system. 
um, the parsing system is more about the words and the tattoos and how the words intermingle. And again, you have to limit the scope because one, it, we would be here forever if we were trying to create all the possibilities of the word. Um, and two, it's again, there's much more efficient systems. Like the reason why a lot of systems do use dice is because it's easy to, I guess, set up to create, to um, interpret. And the deck system was more. It, it was a little bit separate from the parsing system when it was developed. It was developed after the concepts. So cr what we're taking from in this game is the actual story elements, the world building, essentially. Um, so the deck system, it, it could be applied to anything, really. Um, and it's, again, quite complex, and it's it's a different sort of feeling from playing the video game. And that's not what we were intending with this um, iteration of Avarice. So again, it's just a different intents. <laughs> um, does that kind of sum it up? I'd say so. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can definitely see that. And the, the other thing is, um, is in is in regard to group act is in regard to group activity because that was one of the big things that was um that was really ha that was really hammered home that individuals aren't casting spells spells are being cast as a group with the parses and yeah how and um how what were the discussions like about it about implementing that mm -hmm. that's fair um so parslings at least to me. What really stood out about it is it's about teamwork. Um, obviously, the, and to make it to make it transparent here, the game is a single player game. I'm not, I'm not implying it's multiplayer, um, but it's about teamwork, and that's a core theme of the game in both the mechanics and the storytelling. Uh, and so, when parsing happens in the game, that's still based on the tabletop. You need to have two people to parse. Um, you know, their combinations of words will do different things, and so. And I, I want to set a bit of a disclaimer. We're very early on in development, so anything I say in terms of like mechanics or ideas we're having um, can change. Uh, but we have the same general idea, hopefully, <laughs> moving forward. Disclaimer complete. <laughs> um, but it's the concept of teamwork is in the mechanics, and that's having a party, um, parsing with your party members. Uh, even if they're canned, you're still doing the teamwork. You're still parsing. You're still picking different words and using them together. Uh, and in the same sense, enemies might be doing something very similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, enemies will have their own words, and if they're next to each other, and they, you know, you need two of them, they get, it's the same concepts. And so that that idea of teamwork and having to be in a group, and any time someone's alone, that's that's a little odd, right? And and we make sure to make a point of that. Most of the enemies will be in groups, and if they're alone, they're either really strong or they're being singled off, and they're not going to make it very hard. Yeah. And. That brings me to that brings me to something else. Now I've had a bit of a um for, I've had a bit of a formula whenever I look at um, mechanics within video game RPGs, and that that is the more playable characters that there that there are potentially, the the um less customizable they are individually. Um, so mm -hmm. on one, on one extreme you have something like Fallout New Vegas you know where you have just one character and 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 um a complete blank slate and on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum you have Suikoden where you've got 108 characters but you don't have a whole lot of room to customize them individually mm -hmm. um where d where where would you say that Avarice is going to fit into that equation yeah, I, I think that's a pretty apt equation. <laughs> and I'd say it applies to Avarice too. Um, Avarice is very much leaning towards the single character. It's not no level customization um, as Vegas, but it leans towards the Vegas side of things. Mm -hmm. um, this was actually part of our discussion as well. Should we have a million characters with a million words that they can all combine? Or should we have a smaller cast of two to three, two to four characters um, who allow you to really customize your combat uh, style and how you want to approach the combat situations, 
rather than, and so that, that's the direction we went um so yeah leaning towards vegas in terms of small amount of characters more customization rather than a million characters that you can't change anything about which both are fine i want to point out there's no issue with either one but that's just the direction you went it kind of goes along with the directed story and that's well, why we went that direction yeah so usually what happens is that the customer um basically you're still putting them the same amount of options for the players but it's separated whether they're one person or or crashed into one creature or or separated into multiple entities and it really ends up with the same amount of options because with Suridikin you basically changed out um your party based like items really you changed them out like pieces of armor you never really kept the same team comp unless you really liked their move set um and things like to say mm -hmm. the characters themselves start to lose a little bit less meaning and they're treated more like items because yes what is swapped out swapped out mm -hmm. um so in the end it becomes harder to create a story focused around that many characters and it's sort of the same like in tv shows where if you've got too many characters to focus on no one really gets the limelight. You don't really get invested in that many, or your favorite characters don't turn up enough in the story. So we opted to focus on specific characters to allow for a more in-depth storytelling, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Now... Because in the end... Go ahead. Yeah. Because uh, in the end, like, Parsings is very much about defining who you are. Mm -hmm. defining your personalities and what's important to one person may not be the same for someone else but it's about making sure that you understand that and that we do have that clash of wills mm -hmm. now i'll get now this is another one of those big elephants in the room that i have to address when it comes to dealing with a video game rpg because this is what because this is one of those big debates that I remember even ha I remember even having with people in uh, back in gr back in grade school regarding <laughs> regarding video game RPGs and that is are you going real time are you going turn based you're going somewhere in between uh turn based <laughs> easy answer <laughs> Um, I guess arguably there's a potentiality of this is somewhere in between, but it's it's around ninety percent turn based, and mo maybe the whole thing is turn based based on some decisions that we're gonna make. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about being able to come up with a plan and a strategy, not about uh, this game at least rushing the player to yeah. come to some conclusion. Which is again no issue with that kind of game. There's 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 games where it's about the action and the inputs, mm -hmm. um, but this one is about the decisions. And for the record, when it, when I'm referring to some referring to things that would count as something in between um a couple examples that of that would be um any final fantasy game that uses the active time mm -hmm. battle gauge and um knights of the old republic with its whole action queue thing yeah there's a exactly there's a potentiality of action commands mm -hmm. um that's a maybe and it's something we're considering um but it's not for sure yeah now t Given, given that, given that, um, since I talked about the whole customiz customization approach, mm -hmm. um, is it is it going to be a case where the majority of the of the customization, when it comes to individual characters, is going to be rooted in their um, parses? Um, yeah, I would say it's twofold. Um, so. The words, and this is this is purely based on the system, mm -hmm. and, and you know my interpretation of it, and Blue's support of my interpretation of it. Um, the words come from the actions you take, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, a core part of the game, a uh, big goal of it, is to have it so, based on some big action you take, uh, you'll get a certain word, right? And based on how you act in a certain situation, you'll get a certain word. So, still, it's still can like there's not going to be a list of 20 words and you choose one um but you'll be able to approach a situation in two different ways um and based on that you might get one word or another and so it's really about how you act and how you get the words so the second part of, of of customization comes from in classic rpg fashion um what abilities you pick up outside of your parsing so parsing is not the only thing you can do um but how you 
upgrade your character, what you choose to focus on for, for your characters. Um, and there, there are some other things, I, I, I won't name them because I don't want to name things that aren't for sure mechanics, but there are other things we're considering in terms of yeah. you can customize how you do certain parses. I'll keep it vague like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to adva when it comes to advancement, um, have have you guys nailed down whether or not you're going to be going a bit more freeform or a bit more of a level based approach? Uh, can you? I, I get level based. What do you mean I by think, freeform? I think when we're going for level design, I think your traditional JRPGs like well console based RPGs like Golden Sun. Mm -hmm. And I I guess what other games like like um so basically we intend to have like a general overworld map and then you go exploring. So very much like Chrono Trigger, very much like um Golden Sun, very much like along those lines, I believe. Unless we again, this is all subject to change yeah. and adjustment but that's the sort of feel that we're going for although um if, that's not ex that's not exactly what i was shooting for, what i was shooting for when i when i asked about levels i was more i was being a little experience. bit more literal when it came to are you, go, are you oh, going oh right are you going Sorry. with some sort of experience as currency yeah. approach are you going that's with a, <laughs> are you going with a straight um straight linear le linear level approach are you going with um a archetype approach or yeah also, like a leveling system mm -hmm. sure. yeah I can I can talk about that. Um, I think you you nailed it when you said currency. So I don't know if you we haven't really gotten into the concept of the game, but mm -hmm. it's it's Parsling's avarice. It's about a, an extremely greedy world um, filled with greedy pirates, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know I'm a big fan of telling the story through the mechanics as well. And you literally upgrade your characters with currency. <laughs> Like you don't get experience, you get currency. Um, and functionally, it's very similar to XP. There's some small tweaks um, and it won't feel any different likely to the player. That's the idea of how we design it. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a currency based uh, level up system, essentially. All right. I, and the, I can, and given, given that it is going with the currency based approach and you're going with a, um, a sm a small but not singular cast of pl of playable characters. Um, are you guys going to be taking steps to make sure that choice paralysis doesn't become a problem? Yes, absolutely. Uh, some 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 versions of that. I, what I'm really liking about seeing in new modern indie games is accessibility and mm -hmm. and different play styles being being accepted. Um, and the way you see that is being able to go back on decisions and uh, being able to, you know, allowing players who really want to go back if they want, <laughs> essentially. And so uh, versions of that might be your upgrade tree. And then uh, I guess if I don't know if you've played Hades, but in that game, you can just reset. Yeah, you can reset your upgrade tree. And so that's a perfect example. Like you may you don't have as much choice paralysis when you know you can undo things. The funny thing is you end up not really undoing it because it ends up working out anyway. But um, giving them the choice allows them to feel more feel comfortable control. making decisions, mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, of course, the other, the other, um, the other problem that I can that I can foresee happening when you when you go, when you go um free when you go free form is is certain certain choices be certain choices kind of being overshadowed by others. Um, if I were to use an example, I'd I'd, I'd point out how. In certain sh in certain shooters that boast having a huge variety of of weaponry, um, they have that variety, but the choice is really an illusion because there's really five weapons that people always pick. Mm -hmm. um, or I could or I could go with some with say the um, class customization in the infamous Mass Effect Andromeda, where you're effectively building classes without a downside. And so the and so the ad yeah. intended idea of being able to switch between classes on the fly like that doesn't get utilized because, or rather, um, players aren't incentivized to utilize it simply because once they have a particular combo that works, they can just stick with that combo, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, the you know the goal there, and that's that's more I guess of a hopefully we we succeed in the game design department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
you know, the way you do that is to have a balanced skill tree, right? Yeah. Um, making it so that choice A and choice B are not better than each other. And every choice in the game will be like that. In fact, we strictly, this is a bit of a tangent, but when making those decisions that give you words, mm -hmm. we strictly made a, a point of it not being a karma system, good and bad. Um, but in a similar way, when you choose your 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 equipment upgrade or your your, your um sorry your skill tree upgrade um a is not better than b you're missing out on b if you pick a and you're missing out on a if you pick b that and and both of them will work but they're going to be better in certain situations and so the game should be designed and that's the idea from the mechanics the encounters are designed based on the abilities you have not the other way around right mm -hmm. the encounters are designed based on the upgrades you can have at the time and so it's that's a huge value of having this kind of tightly designed RPG rather than this unnecessarily open. Uh, that's where you start to see like power creep. That's where you start to see, um, you, like you said, certain things don't matter because there's so many options. You just pick the good one that you look up online. We, we want to avoid all that. And the, the, since you mentioned, since you mentioned skill trees, that's something else I'm, cur I'm curious about because I think we've all had, I've, I think we've all had in various games that one that moment where there's something on a skill tree that we actually want, but in order to get it, we have to take things that we know are going to be completely useless to our play style. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm cu I'm curious if you guys have um have been keep have been keeping that in mind when it comes to designing skill trees and whether or not it's, are you going with a true tree or are you going with more of a tiered pool like say, um the endless series does. That is a, that's a, that, that, yeah, it's, it's, again, we're very early on in, in a lot of the, the game development aspects. We focus on certain things yeah. before we move up to the next tier. But if I were to give you my um, early on uh, direction that we're probably going to go in, um, I would say that the, the pool, I had actually not considered the pool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um the, the tree is like a classic, right? It's an A-B decision, but then you're right. You end up getting things you don't want. Um, but a pool lets you get something you want in every tier. And so yeah. it's interesting, and it's something we have to consider for sure. Uh, but we don't have a decision there. So yeah. I, I would love to give one, but yeah, we don't have one there. I'm, 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 more, I'm more curious if, it, if this is a... Uh, if this is something that you've taken into consideration, because it is a very common um, pitfall. Um, especially, especially given how long, especially given the issue of choice paralysis and even more so especially given the fact that given how you've met given how you've mentioned leaning a bit more in the freeform end of things i think it would be fair of me to say that that um that well ca that characters might be built on an art might be built around an archetype but not necessarily a class that's fair yeah hmm. um i think that's a good way of summing it up it's a really good way of putting it. it, it it's basically archetype. Sorry, Blue, go ahead. Yeah, so each character does have the role or the type of person, and usually is kind of indicative by the words that we're giving them about who they are, what they want to do, and I guess what kind of personality they play within the world. Mm -hmm. And that certainly does lean and change how we've been designing the characters in terms of what they can do and what we want them to do, be able to do. Mm -hmm. so, and to, yeah, to add on top of that, to speak more towards the, you know, how this is feeds into the skill trees and, and the progression of the characters, um, a character may be a tank, but are they a damage tank? Do they protect the team? Do they soak up damage? Right. Um, it's like sub archetypes or what the equipment, uh, the, sorry, the upgrade trees would be, would be for, mm -hmm. and to speak to the concerns, right. What's, what's been considered, what hasn't, um, the skill tree is going to be tight like the other things in the game. We're trying to focus on small amounts of curated content. And so we're not going to throw together something that uh, um, is just there. It's If it's in the game, the philosophy is that we have given it the time to exploit and make sure it works with the other system. So th those are under consideration, right? We want the player to enjoy using the skill tree and not either ignore it or be frustrated with it, you know? Yeah. And... I'm, gu I'm guessing. Th I'm guessing that given, given how em given how words are emphasized within parceling system, you, would it be fair of me to say that you guys aren't aiming for the for the traditional 
um, equipment setup that you might see in a um, you might see in a turn-based console style RPG. Yeah, you basically nailed it. Have you um, have you played Paper Mario or Darkest Dungeon? I've played Darkest Dungeon and all the DLC. As far as Paper Mario goes, I'm going to need to ask you to be a little more specific. Uh, there's a lot of them, um, but Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door is usually the best reference. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I, I <laughs> have played it. I, en <laughs> I enjoy it. Even if the only thing I didn't enjoy was the general white quest because that because that was a that was one giant waste of my time. Yep. <laughs> it's like you um, sent me all over no, that... the map and he's right there. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. That game that game is a pretty good example of both of those games. There's no equipment. Mm -hmm. Um Darkest Dungeon you pick characters, but in Paper Mario you don't pick equipment. You upgrade your hammer throughout the game, but it's basically a canned upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good way of, of looking at it, right? You get abilities throughout the game, um, but it's not the traditional RPG in the way that, um, you know, I want this shield instead of that hammer. Um, you know, it may look like that with the upgrade tree. Like I said, it's about spending money. So maybe it might say, oh, this you're, you're choosing this shield over that shield, mm -hmm. but it's not, a, it's not equipment. It's an upgrade tree that's been skinned is the best way to think about it. <laughs> All right, I I can definitely um I can definitely get behind that. Now, when it comes to the world, you can't you kind of hinted at this already that you're going to go with the whole, the whole um trinity of wor of world map village dungeon. It's it sounded like um uh I can I'll let you ask the question, but it's a little it's a little different than that. But yeah, um, and I'm well, what I'm curious is because that. That's basically the that's basically the holy trinity of air, of area design that's been established ever since the days of Dragon Quest, mm -hmm. and I'm curious how closely you guys are going to be adhering to that, or if you've got your own twists to the formula that you're planning. I I would argue there's a bit of a twist on that. Um, I would say it's less of a town world map dungeon it's more of town and then the rest of the map is your dungeon right it, your quest is to um go off and may, maybe do something but it's the entire island is that dungeon right and, and sorry to clarify each area on in the game is going to be an island because they're pirates um and so the game is separated into these different islands uh and so an island may have a town. It's not necessary, um, but there may be. A, there's a starting area usually, right? Um, but I think that's a clear thing to make from this game. Is there's no. We're not trying to adhere to anything specifically. Um, we're just delivering uh, what we think will best deliver the gameplay, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it may start that way for players to be familiar. But as the game goes on, maybe it changes. Um, but you know, you got your. It's a little more open than that, and um, we want to do something that RPGs don't tend to do, um, especially these directed story ones, and give a little bit of uh, player choice in terms of what they, how they want to approach uh, exploring, quote unquote, the island. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always a path, but there's branches and parts to go off to the side and things like that. So um, I think it's it's more of you're here, we have, we're here for a reason. Um, we're going to go do that thing rather than Let's go to the dungeon and explore the dungeon. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. And when even and obviously, it'd be, obviously, um, in something something like this, it'd be hard. It'd be, I mean, in theory, you could probably justify a, dun a dungeon, but um, <laughs> in pre in practice, given the themes that you guys are working with, I don't think it would necessarily fit. Yeah, it's, it's it, one of those cases yeah. of are you do? It's one of those cases of I'd imagine having to decide whether or not you're doing this because it's what fit it's what fits what you're doing or because tradition. Mm. You you you've nailed it. If a dungeon is there, it's because it makes sense in the world and in the story. Um, we're we're not doing a dungeon because people expect it. <laughs> um, if speaking of um story now, obviously. I'm not going to ask for um, spoilers for a story that isn't finished yet, but I'm curious about the structure that you're working on with the with the main um, sto with the main story, because 
given the approach of um, subgenre that you guys are going for, mm-hmm. I believe it would be fair of me to infer that you're going with a main a main story and, ser- and a series of um, so- of side objectives throughout a series of acts. Uh, you, oh, yeah, you've nailed it. Um, I would say this is the one thing that probably is the most finished. The story's the story's basically done. The main story. Um, but you've nailed it. There's a main story. Um, it ideally is not the hardest thing to achieve. There's side objectives. There's uh, planned, and then there's kind of more background elements. I think a good, uh, and I don't. I <laughs> it's dangerous to make this comparison, and I don't mean to say it's at any level of what Toby Fox has made. But in the same way that Undertale has a main story, um, and then there's a lot of other stuff going on if you choose to explore it. Um, that's the approach we took influence from. I don't want to say it's <laughs> you're not going to get a whole you know, where 20% of the game is the main story and 70% is the rest of it, like it is in Undertale. But in this game, there's other things going on, right? And um, we chose to present the story in that way as well, where the main story is very surface line. Um, It's very lighthearted, just like (laughs) Undertale. It's very fun. Um, But the game is, it's an adult game, right? There's there's things going on that there's darker themes, there's stuff going on under the surface. Um, And so, yeah, I, I would say the side quest, concept works except there's kind of bigger more important side quests going on is a, is a good way to put it i think and yeah yeah i think it's hot. where i'll go with that i can de- i can definitely um, i can definitely go with that and i'm some something that i'm something that i'm curious about given given a lot of the motifs with this particular approach is the idea of um, shops, especially especially given the name um, Avarice, mm-hmm. is is it a case where where um a qu- where um going going into shops for certain for certain supplies before heading out of an area is going to be one of those things that's visited in this, or is that not in your plan? No, no shops shops and money uh, are more of a like I said a storytelling tool mm-hmm. in this game. Um, rather than a core mechanic in terms of, I guess, in terms of like your traditional shop, right? Your traditional, let me buy a million things. Monster Hunter, let me buy 700 potions and 30 traps. And, you know, that's not what we're going for. And um, mostly because, you know, we really question the idea of why you have those in RPGs. And and I don't mean like um, Monster Hunter, right? A lot of the value in that game is preparing. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of games... I mean, even games like Paper Mario or Dark Dungeon, games we were talking about, you know, um, I played, I love those games. I play them so much, I never buy anything from the store. <laughs> the stores um, need to have a purpose, right? And if you're going to have something that's functionally in your game, I think it should be have some core reasoning to it. Mm-hmm. Um, not that there's not gamers who might have used those or depended on them. Um, but having a store for store's sake is not something we're going for in terms of in, like an economy and, and, and pricing. Um, it, it, money is more of a progression it's system r- yeah it's very much more of a place to upgrade your characters and change things up rather than oh i've got to buy 99 herbs yeah <laughs> um it, it's very much about making meaningful choices at the shops when you do mm-hmm. when you are there and do you want to talk a little bit of the system instead Oh, well, yeah, I can, I can, I think what's an interesting note about this in general um, is, although this is a console RPG inspired game, mm-hmm. um, we definitely didn't just make the game to fit every single RPG trope. We asked ourselves why those tropes existed and whether or not we wanted to keep them. Yeah. And so some examples are the shops. Uh, another example is the um, enemies, uh, you know, respawning. Not that that's a problem, but we ask, why is it there? Do we need it in our game? And so one of the big design choices that we're making is that the enemy encounters are canned. They're designed a certain way. They're like complex little combat puzzles oh. um, rather than something that just continuously spawns. And so, so I it's guess not going to be the... one of those cases of I take a step to the left and then boom, and I'm in an encounter when I'm exactly. trying to get the hell out of the dungeon. Exactly. If you walk through an area and you've defeated the two enemies there, they're gone. <laughs> you defeated them. And that helps in a lot of ways. It helps 
scale the game properly. It helps scale the difficulty and the challenge. It helps give the character unique and canned experiences rather than, again, I, I guess clearly you can see I have a problem with RNGesus. Uh, Everybody um, has I, a I, problem with RNGesus, <laughs> especially and, and, yeah, XCOM players. I should know I'm exactly. one of them. Exactly. And so you ask yourself, why is it there? And there's an answer. It's fair. There's, there's value to randomness. Um, but sometimes I think there might be a little too much. And, and the RPG genre really leans on the console RPG, the turn-based RPG genre, really leans on just millions of encounters, uh, grinding, uh, things like that, that just personally I don't enjoy. And I'm sure a lot of people who want to play RPGs find it to be a wall. Yeah. Now, I've... I I never ha I don't have I don't I don't object to the to the idea of going with RNG and going with a bit of grindy. Um, what I I think I think where I end up drawing the line personally when it comes to RNG is one when uh, when um, RNG is a lie, which is why I bring up XCOM because if you've played an XCOM game, you're probably familiar with the RNG bullshit that it does. <laughs> um. And two, it's two when um, when you're basically farming, and yeah. I I kind of I kind of burned myself out on on any sort of farming mechanic after pl after playing way too many of those early days um, sandbox MMOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, y yeah. It... <sighs> Again, there's no issue with it, and there's a, it's a specific type of player that does very much enjoy that and so there's no i am not going to downplay that at all um and there are plenty of rpgs that do that amazingly you know they they feed that space um but there's not many rpgs that feed the space of the gamer who, who wants the new experiences um rather than the, the you know mastering the repeated the farmer the, the grind the challenge or the, the there is value to power gamers in the sense that you know those side objectives may be harder than the main ones and they're mm -hmm. a little more involved right so yeah. the, the the offshoots they're there right so the, the players can still can still go crazy if they want but just in a different sense mm -hmm. now when it comes to the development schedule that you that you guys have for it um when when do you how how when do you think would be a um, window that you guys are planning as far as show as far as showing Either um t either concept art or f or sc or test screenshots or or what have you, when it comes to a visual representation for mm -hmm. Avarice. Yeah, you should see concept art soon. Actually, if you I don't know if you follow uh, at Mosaic underscore Studios or Smunchy Games. I follow um, Smunchy. But... I'm not sure if I follow. I'm, I'm not sure if I follow Mosaic. <laughs> I'll get you that. <laughs> um, but um, Mosaic Studios has started posting and sh and spongy uh, our, our publisher re 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 always retweets them mm -hmm. um has been posting some very early art so far it's just been the title but we do have plenty of concept art to post we're mostly backlogging it and and we're going to slowly start releasing it there's, there's a lot of really good designs from both blue and our other artists tori um it's seriously like crazy professional level stuff i'm very it's really awesome working with these two um, but yeah, soon there's going to be concept art coming out. And then in terms of gameplay um, content, I won't make any promises. I, I, I know the danger of that. But um, there is a potential that we, we, we release some gameplay content, mm -hmm. uh, a screenshot or GIF um, by the end of March or early April. That's, that's one of our goals. Um, but again, <laughs> no promise on that. But concept art. Uh, even sprite work, uh, we want to share a lot of stuff and be very open about the game process. And so you'll see, um, yeah, concept art, screenshots, music. Um, you know, we have some some stories we're writing. And so we really want to en engross people and players and, and, and hopefully make some fans uh, in, in the world of, of Avarice. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll definitely be looking for looking forward to seeing how that how that turns out and I know I, I know I ended up painting broad brush with a lot of it but once once some more um once some more substantial mater material comes along whether that up to up to and or including full, um full tra full trailers um I'd love I'd love to have you guys back up, back on to to um slowly dive a bit more a bit more deeply into the layers of the of Parsling's avarice yeah you know? we have a lot more to 
to talk about. <laughs> you, know, like a, you know, like a giant geeky onion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pretty much nailed it. Oh. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. Sure thing. Thanks for having us. This is awesome. It was fun to talk about things again. <laughs> and as, and Leo, you're, you're going to be familiar with this, but anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. As I Absolutely. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> we'll catch you later too and, and of course yep. a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay fucking frosty everybody <laughs>